Okay, welcome back to our afternoon plenary session. Um, just a, a note of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, the evaluations are being passed out just in the last couple of minutes. Does anyone not have one? Okay. Um, we need, if you are seeking uh, continuing education, we will need to receive the evaluation out at the registration table at the end of the day, and we'll need to collect your name that you've submitted an evaluation. And then once we have that, um, you will get your certificate on Monday via email. Um, should I introduce you or? Would you like to come up here and look? Oh, because it says July 31st. I actually, okay. Well, um, let me formally introduce our next speaker. Um, this is Dr. Mark Hurst. This is very special that he can be here today. He is a uh, longtime former colleague of mine and a close friend. As medical director of the Ohio Department of Health, Dr. Mark Hurst advises the director of health on clinical and medical issues as the agency fulfills its mission to protect and improve the health of all Ohioans. Dr. Hurst is board certified in psychiatry and addiction psychiatry. Previously, Dr. Hurst worked at the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services for more than 26 years, most recently holding the positions of director and medical director of the agency. Before his career with the state, he held leadership positions in psychiatry and addiction psychiatry in the Veterans Affairs Health System at Harding Hospital and at The Ohio State University. Dr. Hurst is a native of Zanesville and a graduate of both Muskingum College and the Medical College of Ohio. He completed his medical residency training at the University of Michigan and The Ohio State University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hurst. Good afternoon, everybody. Boy, <laughs> it's been a long day and a long week, hasn't it? Yeah. Let me say a good afternoon, everybody. And this is not the right presentation. So, um, so has it been a good day so far? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, for me too. I think I'll be okay. That doesn't mean anything. After all, I am a physician. I need help in about everything I do. So. No offense, Dr. Johnson. I'm speaking from personal experience only. <laughs> um, so I am actually from southeastern Ohio originally. I grew up in Zanesville. And uh, it's always a real pleasure for me to come down to this part of the state. Uh, you know, I get to see the hills that I never see in the Columbus area. And uh, there are just... Uh, so many advantages to it. I really miss my home and, uh, and being in this kind of area. It gives me a very warm feeling. So we do have the right presentation here. And so now we'll get started. So again, I'm Dr. Mark Hurst. Uh, I've been one of the warriors in this fight for a long time, as have many of you. And I'm just so delighted to be able to talk to you about this. For years, I have talked on the opioid crisis and uh, haven't had much good news. And although the news is not great, we're starting to see some real changes in Ohio with this. And I'll get into that a little bit. And it's something that is really a tribute to each and every one of you and the diligent work that has been done in the areas of prevention, early intervention, treatment, life-saving measures, and coming together as communities to approach that. Because that's really what's making the difference uh, here in Ohio. So this is where it all starts. This is the opium poppy. It's a very beautiful flower. Uh, many of us grow it in, your, in our yards. I grow it in my yard. Uh, it's a, a really pretty flower that blooms in late May and early June. And, um, okay. <laughs> it, it, you know, it blooms in late May and early June. And the flowers last barely a week or 10 days if you're lucky. And if there's a storm, you lose the flowers long before that. And what was a beautiful flower suddenly becomes this ugly green bulb with dying foliage that you really don't know what to do with. And in a lot of ways, that's a metaphor for opioids, isn't it? There's this beautiful experience 
when a person takes an opioid that is very short-lived and then an ugly experience that lasts for a long time that we don't know what to do with. And if you take that green bulb and you snap off the green bulb, there's this kind of rubbery resin that comes out of it, a white milky kind of substance, and that's where opioids are. Uh, now, I don't extract the opioids from it from the op poppies I grow in my yard. I advise you don't do it either because the DEA will come to you and, and have some attention about doing so. But it is a really pretty flower and I enjoy growing them. And many of us remember the Wizard of Oz, right? When Dorothy and her companions are, they see the, crisp, they see the, uh, the crystal city here and they're uh, about ready to run to it and suddenly these these poppies appear, which are beautiful. And they start running through the poppies, and as they run through the poppies, they fall down and fall asleep, which we know is one of the effects of, of opioids, right? People get asleep, and it sedates them to the point eventually where they can stop breathing and die from it. That didn't happen with Dorothy and her companions, but it is certainly that ha something that happens. But this isn't so pretty, is it? These are some notable individuals uh, in, in American history who have, uh, who have experienced negative effects from opioids. The one on the top left is Edgar Allan Poe, who's well known as an alcoholic, but also was an opium addict. In the uh, bottom left is John Belushi, who died almost 40 years ago from an overdose of uh, heroin and cocaine mixed together, known as a speedball, something that we're seeing again. So we know that opioids and problems with opioids and deaths associated with opioids are not something new. But in the most recent epidemic, we've had other notable individuals who have passed away. Heath Ledger, uh, who died from an OxyContin overdose, and then Prince, who died just a couple years ago from a fentanyl overdose, which is really the trend of opioids that we've seen in this state and in the country going from a prescription op opioid overdose problem, pre prescription opioid problem, to heroin, then to fentanyl. And I heard uh, this morning on the news that it was actually in 1970 today that Janis Joplin died from a heroin overdose, so 49 years ago today. So this is something that's been with us uh, even well beyond those periods. And also not so pretty, uh, this is uh, what we have seen in the United States for the past uh, five years in terms of overdose rates. The darker counties are the ones that have the highest rates of overdose, the lighter ones are the ones that have lesser rates of overdose. And you can see that it's very much clustered in the higher rates in Southern Ohio and in Northeastern Ohio, particularly in many of our rural Appalachian counties. Okay, so now some audience participation. Which of the following is associated with increased use of an addictive substance? Increased availability, Decreased belief in harmfulness of the substance, both or neither? Oh, you guys are too good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So why am I bringing that up here? Well, the perceived risk of a drug has something to do with the likelihood of it being used. And if there's a perception of decreased uh, harmfulness of a drug, then um, it's going to be more likely to be used. So we see that we've seen this with a lot of things. In the early 2000s, we saw this with anabolic steroids. A lot of young high school men felt that they were not really particularly problematic. We saw increased use with that. We saw increased problems associated with it. Their perception of harmfulness went up and people used less of it. That's something we have seen with the opioid crisis as well. Dr. Johnson and I remember very well in the mid 1990s when there was a change in medical culture. Because prior to that, we were taught that opioids were very good and effective medication for acute and severe pain, but their use should be limited in other kinds of conditions. And in that era, there was uh, a concern that we were undermanaging pain. Probably some element of truth to that, particularly in end-of-life care and in palliative situations. But it really went kind of out of control. And how did it go out of control? Well, a number of uh, certification organizations started to call pain the fifth vital sign. We needed to do a number of different things, like we needed to do a pain assessment on each and every patient who came to us. If there was pain, it needed to be on a treatment plan, and we needed to have an approach to, do, to deal with it. Now, nobody really said you need to prescribe opioids for pain, but they said you do need to address it more. And then certain pharmaceutical companies and others kind of preyed upon that and said, 
Well, you know, opioids, which were previously used for this, actually can be used for chronic pain every bit as much of this. And they cited a study, which was actually not a study, it was just a letter with a small number of patients in it, that, found, that said um, when pain is used uh, for individuals with pain in a hospital setting, very few of them become addicted to it. As an addiction psychiatrist, it didn't make a lot of sense to me because I know there's a certain prevalence of drug addiction that exists, and the prevalence that they cited was actually lower than the prevalence in the general population. I can't exactly figure out why that would be. But that said, we had an endorsement of a decreased perception of harmfulness. We had increased availability of the drug. And between about 1995 and 2011 in Ohio and in many states, we saw the rate of prescribing of these drugs and dispensing of these drugs go up. We saw larger amounts of the drugs being, uh, being prescribed. We saw higher doses being prescribed. And what was not seen until several years into this, like five or 10 years into it, was there was a parallel increase in deaths due to opioids. And Dr. Gay over here was one of the first people who recognized that and actually did a very nice graph and study that was associated with it that showed the two going up in parallel with a co co correlation coefficient of 0.97. So if you're not a statistic statistician, one's as good as you can do. That's like getting a 97% on a test. So that shows a high correlation between those two. But at that point, the horse was out of the barn that we had, had, we had thousands of individuals who were addicted to these substances and further things happened that were associated with it. I'm gonna stay on this slide just for a second because column one should be of concern to us, that the perceived risks of smoking marijuana once or twice a week is not very high in young people. So we have decreased perception of harmfulness. We have medical marijuana in Ohio at some point we will probably have recreational marijuana in Ohio and increased availability. We can predict from previous situations what that might lead to. And in fact, it is starting to lead to it. So this is uh, pe uh, people age 12 and older who are new initiates, meaning they're using a drug for the first time. And we can see that with marijuana, that's starting to creep up. It is not a harmless drug, but that's for another day. Let's get back to opioids here. How many people are misusing opioids in Ohio? About 500,000, uh, and the majority of them are misusing prescription opioids. Now, misuse does not necessarily mean that they're addicted to the drug. What misuse means is they're not using it for the approved medical indication. So if I go home and my shoulder's starting to bother me and my wife has some opioids that were left over from a surgery she has and I take that opioid, that's misuse of the drug. If it's prescribed to me for pain, and I have some left over, and I'm not sleeping real well, and I decide to take it for sleep, that's misuse of the drug too, which is why we're especially concerned about leftover opioids in people's houses. Only about 10% use heroin or other kinds of opioids in Ohio, and uh, those who use heroin frequently also use prescription opioids as well as other drugs. And we, lo we look at this in the United States. The small circle that is on the right uh, indicates people who are using heroin. So the majority of people who are misusing opioids in the United States, as well as in Ohio, are misusing prescription drugs. It's only a small percentage who are using heroin or other drugs that are similar to heroin, such as fentanyl and things like that. What it tells us is how lethal heroin and associated drugs are, because that's really where we're seeing the majority of fatalities in Ohio at this point. So this is something that's uh, kind of interesting to me. This is outside my office at the Ohio Department of Health. A hundred years ago, well, now 101 years ago, uh, there was an, uh, a nationwide pandemic of influenza, which affected Ohio and much of, uh, much of the world, uh, in, fact, in fact, the entire world. And in Ohio that year, we had over a million cases of influenza, and we had 9,000 deaths. So message number one as the medical director of the Department of Health is get your flu shot, get your flu shot every year. That's just an aside. But when we talk about the opioid epidemic, where are we with this? In 2018, 100 years after this, we had 130,000 Ohioans with an opioid use disorder. Now remember the previous slide that said 500,000. Not all of those people had an opioid use disorder. These are people with a diagnosable opioid use disorder and we had 3,000 opioid-related deaths. 
And you look at that and you say, well, you know, okay, so that's not nearly as many people who died in the influenza epidemic. When you add up the previous 10 years for this, you're going to come up with a number well over 8,000. And when you add up years of, uh, years of potential life lost, you're going to come up with a million years of potential life lost in Ohio, which was actually a study that was done right here uh, at Ohio U, an incredible amount. When we get to the fundamentals of this, though, we need to remember that this is a disease that affects, all, that affects individuals, and it affects individuals' brains. Any good drug of abuse is going to cause euphoria, and that means it's going to bind in those purple areas, which are called the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area. I swear there will not be a test about this at the end. But whether we're talking about cocaine or opioids or cannabis or any drug, or nicotine for that matter, any drug that causes an urge to repeatedly use it, it will cause a binding in that area, and opioids do that. So the bottom line is that substance use disorders are brain disorders. But we also know some other things, like not everybody who uses drugs develops a drug use disorder. So many of us in this room, in fact, most of us have probably been exposed to opioids at some point in our life, but very few of us develop opioid dependence. And, you know, why is that? Or as we say in Zanesville, where I'm from, how's come? How's come that is that people who, some people get a drug use disorder and some don't? Well, first we need to keep in mind it's just not about the use of the drug and that there are certain signs and symptoms that are associated with it. A person can take a high dose of any drug and not have a drug use disorder associated with that if there are not behaviors surrounding that that are typical of addiction, like craving the drug like not being able to control the use of the drug, like having that urge to use it again and again and again, spending a lot of time recovering from the use of the drug, using the drug, making sure you have a supply available. These are the symptoms of addiction, and there are many others, and continuing to despite, use despite problems related to use. What are those factors that contribute to addiction? Well, genetics is a big part of it. Uh, is this a genetic disease? It is, in part, a genetic disease. About 50% of the liability for addiction lies in, uh, lies in genetics, but that's not the whole story. Environment and life experiences have something to do with it, too. Exposure to addictive substances is an important part of it, especially early in life. So if you're never exposed to a substance, you're not going to develop addiction to that substance. But the earlier in life you are exposed to a substance, the more likely it is that you are going to develop addiction which is why we're very concerned about people earlier in their life drinking, using tobacco, being exposed to marijuana, being exposed to opioids and things like that unnecessarily. If we can delay that or eliminate that, we're going to be successful in decreasing the overall addiction rate in our country. Early life trauma is an important piece of this also. The more kinds of life trauma that an individual has during childhood, the more likely it is that life is not going to turn out well in many ways. Individuals who have a lot of early life trauma are less likely to graduate from high school. They're more likely to have teen pregnancy. They're more likely to be incarcerated. They're more likely to have suicide attempts. They're more likely to have mental illness. They are more likely to have addiction. They're more likely to develop cancer prematurely, and they're more likely to develop heart disease. Addiction is one of those things that relates to early life trauma that tells us something about an intervention point for us that can be successful. Life stress is a part of that, and then other predisposing conditions like having a mental illness other than addiction and the characteristics of the drug. With drugs that are more potent and shorter lasting, uh, having a, more, a higher propensity for addiction. So all of those influence the brain's response to opioids and the likelihood of developing an opioid use disorder. Those of us who have been exposed to opioids and haven't developed an opioid use disorder have brains that react to these drugs differently than people who develop that kind of an addiction. And I mentioned trauma briefly. There's a, been a study, Appalachian Diseases of Despair, that was published a couple years ago, and it links uh, the circumstances in Appalachia and increased rates of addiction, increased rates of overdose, increased rates of suicide, and things like that. If you have not seen that, I would really recommend it. So we have this established opioid crisis in Ohio. How do we respond to it? 
Well, prevention is, uh, of course, the best thing. Pre an ounce of prevention is genuinely worth a pound of cure. But when we deal with this from a public health perspective, we need to have a global response to it. Prevention is one of those. Early intervention is one of those. So trying to respond to this before a person develops a drug use disorder in the first place, when we first start to see some problems associated with it. Treatment that is effective and evidence-based, harm reduction approaches that I'll touch on briefly, interdic interdiction or law enforcement, which is usually not part of response to a public health problem or an epidemic, but in this case is, by disrupting supply chains, driving up the price of the drug and things like that, that can make a difference. But even more importantly, the role of law enforcement in terms of helping individuals who may be intervened on by police uh, to enter treatment eventually. What kind of prevention efforts are we looking at? Well, there are some real simple things that help, like talking to kids about drugs. A responsible adult talking to kids about drugs decreases their likelihood of use by about 50%. And you know, I, I'm not talking about, I see somebody walking down the street and I say, hey kid, don't use drugs. <laughs> I, 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 that may be helpful, I, I don't know. You know, they get a good laugh out of it or something. But you know, a, a, ideally a parent, but if not a parent, a coach, a teacher, a neighbor, some res a pastor, some responsible adult really talking to a kid about drugs and saying this is not a good idea. That alone decreases the likelihood by 50%. Having somebody who cares and cares enough to talk to somebody makes a difference. Having dinner with family more nights of the week than not. Uh, so there is something called the Family Meal Program uh, that is actually out of Harvard that has looked at this pretty extensively. And you know, just sitting down with family more nights of the week than not, talking about how the week has been, you know, actually saying, how did the school day go to get day? What happened? What didn't? And, you know, we know about a third of the time the kids are going to say, you know, how was your school day? Fine. You know, how are your grades? They're fine. How are your friends? They're fine. But we're asking the questions and we're caring and we're actually putting eyes on one another and seeing how we're all doing. Involving kids in extracurricular activities, sports, band, theater, things like that, that makes a difference too. Decreasing the opportunities for exposure to addictive substances to delay that onset uh, of use. And one of the most important things is discarding all addictive drugs when they're no longer needed. If you take nothing else home today, clean out your medicine cabinet. Because the medication that you have left over from that hernia repair that you had five years ago Chances are you're not going to need that. But it is a risk factor for your kids or somebody who's visiting your house to get in your medicine cabinet when they're going to the restroom and unnecessarily being exposed to that drug. So get rid of those drugs. There are environmentally sensitive ways to do that uh, that we can talk about if we get a couple of minutes. But it's a really important thing to do. And then for the, uh, for the prescribers here, following prescribing guidelines is also really important. There are a couple specific interventions with this. One is uh, something called Start Talking, and there's a, a website associated with that. And there's Generation Rx, which is a program for schools to talk about medications. Both of them are very good. Another form of prevention has to do with appropriate prescribing by physicians. So there have been a number of things that have happened with this, starting with guidelines being uh, developed in 2012. The first ones were guidelines for emergency departments in acute care settings. Because at that point, we found that there were many individuals who were going to emergency departments because they had run out of medication and then receiving refills in amounts that really were not appropriate, like going to the emergency department and getting a 30-day 30, uh, 30 supply. That's really not appropriate. You know, what the appropriate thing to do is if someone in fact needs an opioid medication, it's to give them an amount until they can get to their primary care physician uh, and, and have it dealt with in a more definitive kind of way. We then went on to do guidelines for prescribing opioids in chronic pain uh, and then guidelines for acute pain outside of emergency departments. All of them were consensus guidelines. So they were developed with practitioners, with advocacy groups, with patients participating to come up with what the basic framework with that uh, was. This moved on then to formal rules. Now, what's the difference between a rule and a guideline? A guideline is we really think this is how people should practice, and that's important. 
a rule is something that is put in place by licensure boards and says you must ad abide by uh, this practice, uh, by, this, by this way of practicing. And if you fail to do this, so there's a potential for disciplinary action associated with it. And there was a lot of work that went into that. And probably the most difficult work that went into it was to assure that opioids were being prescribed and not overprescribed, but also that patients had access to pain medication when they need, needed to. And threading that needle was something that was really very difficult to do. And I think we have been successful in Ohio in doing that. We don't have any arbitrary limits in terms of dose or duration. We do have checkpoints that are associated with it. And if you exceed those checkpoint kind of values, you can still go ahead to do so, but you might need to do things like talk to another physician, you're gonna to need to document it in the medical record and things like that. We were very concerned that people needed to continue to get appropriate pain medication. Uh, so we've really kind of closed the whole loop here with rules for acute pain and subacute and chronic pain. To help both patients and prescribers, there's a website called Take Charge Ohio and it's takechargeohio.org. Uh, and so this is, again, a resource for people about the management of pain and the management of opioid medication. So you might be saying, well, why is all this focus on prescription medications? Isn't the issue right now fentanyl? Isn't that really what the problem is? Well, um, yes, you're right on some level. But we also know that we're seeing pain reliever misuse going up uh, as the first substance being used other than alcohol or tobacco progressively in recent years. It used to be real clear. You know, back when Dr. Gay and I were in, start, got started in the field, it was real predictable, wasn't it? First use was alcohol, cigarettes sometime after that, first illicit drug was marijuana. That was always the case. Well, now we're seeing more alcohol, sometimes tobacco, and then marijuana or opioids. And the course of opioid addiction is much more rapid than the co course of, uh, of, of cannabis uh, dependence. So that's something that's of concern to us. But what's also of concern is where do people get those opioids the first time they misuse them? And the place they're more likely to get them? Family and friends. So again, we go back to that leftover supply of opioids that I have from the hernia repair I had three years ago. If we can decrease and eliminate that, we're gonna have less teens that are exposed to this drug earlier in life with less likelihood for them to develop addiction down the road. So this is really a very important uh, function for us. One of the really important things we uh, have done here in Ohio is work with our prescription drug monitoring program. So every state in the nation now has a prescription drug monitoring program. Before a physician prescribes a controlled drug and then at certain other points, after prescribing that controlled drug, they need to check this thing called ORS, uh, which is a prescription drug monitoring program. And you get in there, and when you get in there, it says what prescriptions for controlled drug your patient may have received. So that really helps with a lot of different things. So you get in there, and you know, I'm ready to prescribe uh, an opioid to one of my patients, and I get in there and I see, oh my gosh, they've gotten a prescription from three other doctors and they should have about three months worth right now. That tells me I need to talk to that patient in a different kind of way and probably not prescribe the opioids at that point. So we were kind of going along at kind of an average level in terms of people checking this particular program, and then it really went up in 2017 and 2018. So in 2017, we had about 90 million checks in Ohio by physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants, and it went up to 142 million in 2018. I don't know the nationwide data for 2018, but I do for 2017. In 2017, in the entire United States, there were 300 million checks in prescription drug monitoring programs. We had 89 million of them here in Ohio. So, you know, we are really leading the way uh, in this in terms of prescribing. Ma'am, you had a question, yes. I believe that to be true. Um, and we're seeing an outcome from it also. So the, the point was that AMA has said that Ohio has the best system. Um, we also have a requirement in Ohio that you have to check these. That's one of the rules that we have uh, that's in place. 
but we've also done some things that other states have not. And one of them is to integrate the checks of this into electronic health record systems. So you can imagine, you know, your, you know, your doctor's there and they're working on their electronic health record and they have to check this. And if checking it means you gotta get out of your electronic health record, go to another site, access that, and then go back to your electronic health record, there are a couple of steps that you really don't wanna do. But by integrating it into that, and it's been integrated in most of the uh, big electronic health records, it's a lot easier. You just pop a button, you're there, you can go on with your work. So that's something that was really helpful. And that was done between 2016 and 2017. And associated with this, we've seen a significant decline in the dispensing of opioid medications in Ohio. So the peak was in 2012, which was 793 million doses. Uh, so if you want to do the math, there are about 11 uh, million Ohioans. And so you, you, know, you do that. That's a lot of medications per each man, woman, and child in Ohio. And it was down to 468 million. Uh, in 2018, which is a 42% reduction, which is very substantial. Doctor shoppers, meaning people who are uh, getting prescriptions from multiple prescribers uh, and multiple pharmacies, are down almost 90% from 2011, another step in the right direction. And then, uh, you know, we're also seeing uh, other things that are associated with this. Uh, what, what drugs are most commonly seen in overdoses these days? If you look in the middle where it says natural and semi-synthetic opioids, these are, those are basically prescription drugs, and that is down substantially also. So I'll ask the question of Dr. Gay here. Dr. Gay, we saw a 42% reduction in prescribing of prescription opioids over a period here. What percent reduction in deaths associated do you think we're seeing? over that same time frame. Okay, so we saw a 42% reduction in the prescribing of opioids from 2012 to uh, 2018. We've also seen a reduction in deaths from 2012 to 2018. What number do you think that is? What percentage do you think that is? It's pretty close to 42%. So it's exactly, it's pretty much the same as what we saw going up. That the prescribing and the deaths associated with prescription drugs went like this. And as the prescribing is decreasing, we're seeing pretty much the same thing on the other end of the curve. It's, it's an interesting correlation. We're also seeing less benzodiazepine prescribing. So drugs like Valium and Xanax and things like that. Stimulants are another story. Stimulants are pretty consistent in how they've been uh, prescribed. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes here too. So as we talk about all of these things, we can't forget that uh, alcoholism has not gone away. In, in fact, we're seeing just as much alcoholism as we have ever seen, if not a little bit more. So uh, this is something for us to make sure we remember as well. So of all of those people who have alcohol use disorders or drug use disorders, which was about a little bit over 20 million as seen on the previous slide here, about 10% get treatment in any given year. Uh, and so sometimes that's perceived as, oh my gosh, we need a tenfold increase in beds in order to treat addiction. Not so fast. We have to remember that this is a chronic disease. This is not an acute di disease. And, and part of the trouble we got into in the past was we treated it like it was an acute disease. So people who had addiction, you know, what we would do is uh, we would have them go to 28 days of inpatient treatment. Then we'd discharge them and say, you need to go to AA meetings. And if they relapsed, we'd put them through the same thing because they obviously didn't get it the first time. And if they relapsed again, we'd say, gosh, you're just not ready for treatment yet. Problem was, we were treating a chronic disease with an, acute, uh, with, an, with an acute approach. And we need to look at treating this with a chronic approach also. But of those 90% who don't get treatment, we need to look at why they don't get treatment. 95% of them didn't feel they needed treatment. So there are interventions we can use for that, but taking people who don't think they need treatment and putting them in an inpatient bed is not likely to be successful. We do have ways of dealing with it though. 
about 3% felt they needed treatment, but they just felt like they weren't ready for it yet. And about 2% tried to get treatment and were not successful in doing so. And when we look at some of those things that we can do, one of them is early intervention. It's something called SBIRD, screening, intervent, screening, brief intervention, and referral for treatment. So if someone is saying, yeah, I don't know, maybe I should get treatment, we have a process called motivational interviewing we can use to try to help them find the reasons within themselves that it might be good for them to look at changing their using pattern. And if they don't feel they're ready for that, if, if it's like, you know, I know, Doc, you're telling me I've got a problem, but I don't have a problem, those same motivational techniques can be used to try to get them to the point where they start entertaining thoughts that maybe, in fact, I do have a problem. And for the providers in here and for everybody, we always need to keep in mind that a patient's reasons to change behaviors are a lot better than our reasons that we think they should change behaviors. That, you know, if somebody comes to me and I check their liver enzymes and everything, oh my gosh, look at these liver enzymes, and I say, you need to quit drinking because your liver enzymes are up, that's usually not especially impactful. But if they say, I'm having insomnia, or I'm having marital problems, or I'm having trouble at work, and we can correlate that with their use of drugs or alcohol, that's gonna be a lot more likely to be successful because those are their reasons to quit, not my reasons to quit. But this is a very good evidence-based and effective way of dealing with it. So, when we get back again, why would people uh, not be able to get treatment? Not ready to stop using, we knew that was really important. No healthcare coverage or couldn't afford the cost. That is a big one. Uh, and so that's something that we can and have dealt with. Didn't know where to go for treatment. So having referral lines and things like that can make a difference. Didn't find the program that was a program that offered the type of treatment that was wanted. And that's something we really need to take a look at too. That if we only have one option available, residential treatment, inpatient treatment, whatever, and a person says, I'm not going in a hospital, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to leave my house, I'll do it outpatient. We need to have those options available so, so we can meet people where they are with it. Might cause neighbors or community to have a negative opinion of them, um, which is always interesting. You know, I've been having a problem with drug use for a substantial time, and usually my family and neighbors know about that before I do, but I'm concerned that my family or neighbors are going to have a negative opinion if I get treatment. That said, it's a reality. You know, that, that, you know well, Joe's a user and we understand that, but if you get treatment, Sometimes people look at people, at, at others in a more negative light associated with it, which really doesn't make sense, and that's part of the whole overall stigma of the disease, and that it might have a negative effect on the job. Again, that's a reality. We know that using has a negative effect on the job, but sometimes getting treatment has a negative effect too, uh, and we need to make it easy for people to get treatment. So we have ways of dealing with all, all of those barriers. So another audience participation. What happened in January of 2014? Medicaid expansion began in Ohio. The Ohio State Buckeyes won the inaugural FCS National Championship game. Both or neither? Ah, and everybody's not yelling out the answer this time, are you? <laughs> okay. How many say A only? How many say B only? How many say C only? And how many say D? Okay, we don't have any Ds, so the answer is A. The Ohio State Buckeyes won the championship game uh, in 2015. <laughs> Aren't you glad I'm not your professor asking these kind of questions? You know, I, I, yeah, that's really a nasty question. Um, but yeah, Medicaid expansion has been extremely helpful in Ohio to provide a payer source for people to, uh, to, get, uh, to get treatment for addiction. Because particularly uh, young men uh, often didn't qualify for Medicaid. They qualified for no kind of insurance reimbursement and receiving treatment became very difficult with that. So Medicaid provided a payer source for many people. So we talked about prevention, we talked about early intervention, what about treatment? Yet we need to keep in mind, chronic disease requires monitoring and treatment that corresponds to the evolution of that disease over time. People may well need inpatient treatment or residential treatment in, in order to get stabilized, but that's not for the rest of their life, and this disease is for the rest of their life. So we have to have a process that when the needs are acute, we provide acute treatment, 
and when the needs are chronic, which they're going to be for a long time, we provide a lower level of persistent treatment to help people through the recovery process. Stabilization is where we usually start out. Then we need to have effective psychological treatments. Pharmacological treatments or medication-assisted treatment is key for the treatment of opioid addiction. And then recovery supports that I know you heard some about earlier today, like safe and stable housing, like employment, like other kinds of things. Achieving abstinence without improving one's life and having things that keep people abstinent in recovery is extremely difficult. You know, everybody wants to have a job. Everybody wants a safe place to live. Those are the things that give meaning to life. And that's such an important part of a recovery program. We have evidence-based psychosocial treatments. We have cognitive behavioral therapies. We have multidimensional family therapy, particularly for adolescents. Motivational interviewing we talked a little bit about for SBIRT, but is helpful in other phases of the disease also. Contingency management is a greatly underutilized but very effective treatment for addi addiction. And then 12-step facilitation. All those can be very helpful and have an evidence base that's associated with them. Medication-assisted treatment. So we basically have three options, uh, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. All of them work a little bit differently, and all of them have an effectiveness. And all of them have positive outcomes associated with them. Without using these drugs, the relapse rate's very high, as much as 90%. But patients who get medication-assisted treatment have much lower relapse rates. There are fewer fatalities. There are less arrests. There's more employment. There's less needle sharing. And so it goes to say that having availability and use of medication system can lower mortality. It can improve recovery rates. It can re de uh, decrease individual costs and societal costs of opioid use disorders. And this has expanded markedly in Ohio in the past several years. Three years ago, we had about 1,000 providers in Ohio who could offer medication-assisted treatment. Today, we have over 3,000. Uh, so this is something that has increased substantially. Uh, but then, you know, I hear things about medication-assisted treatment. And you hear this, too. You hear it's a crutch. Right? Anybody ever hear that? Dr. Gay, you've heard that. I've heard that. So, you know what? I'll buy that. How many people here have ever been on crutches? Where are they? Why don't you have them now? Got better, right? So you used a crutch to help you function until you got well enough that you didn't need the crutch anymore. Sounds okay to me. I also hear, why would you use a drug to treat a problem with a drug? Has anybody ever heard that one? Sure. But I hope that we've established that the problem isn't a drug. The problem is a brain disorder. The problem is individuals who respond to the use of a drug in a way that causes problems in their lives. So we're not using a drug to treat a problem with a drug. What we're doing is using a medication to treat a brain disorder. Just like we're using anticonvulsants to treat epilepsy, which is a brain disorder. We're using exactly the same thing for this. Overcoming that stigma is really important. And then we hear sometimes that, um, well, I know somebody who went to treatment and they relapsed right away. You know, this treatment doesn't really work. This treatment works, and it works really well. In fact, the response rates for addiction treatment and opioid addiction treatment is as good as the rates for the treatment of other chronic diseases. It's as good as the treatment of diabetes because people relapse with diabetes sometimes. It's as good as the treatment with hypertension because people relapse with hypertension sometimes. And it's as good as it is with asthma because people have exacerbations of asthma also. People have exacerbations of addiction. It doesn't mean that treatment failed. What it means is that they're having an exacerbation of their disorder, and what we need to do is look at the treatment plan and see what steps we need to take yes to, yet at that point to restabilize things. Harm reduction still, can ten, still tends to be a little bit of a, a controversial uh, subject around the United States. I don't really like to use the word harm reduction too much. I like to use the term saving lives because harm reduction saves lives. Uh, naloxone availability. 
So naloxone is a drug that can re reverse the effects of an opioid overdose. Tens of thousands of doses of naloxone are used in Ohio every year. And our reduction in relapse uh, in overdose rates in the past several, in the past year or so has a lot to do with naloxone availability. It's not exclusively due to naloxone availability, but it has a lot to do with naloxone uh, availability, as well as prevention, as well as evidence-based treatment. It's all of it coming together. Uh, syringe service programs or needle exchange programs. Some people will say, well, you know, you're, you're letting people do this, you're encouraging them to use and things like that. No, we're really not encouraging them to use. What we're encouraging is for them to be alive. And, you know, the last I checked, the response rate for dead people in treatment is not particularly high. And, and, um, and that's really not meant to be a joke. I mean, I, I get a little bit upset about this sometimes. And the same thing for naloxone. You know, oh, well, people are having naloxone parties and they're just resuscitating each other. I... I don't know how we can say, how we can withhold a life-saving treatment from anybody for any particular reason. And sometimes I hear, you know, well, how many times should we use naloxones on somebody? This person was resuscitated four times last month. How many times are we going to keep doing it? So, I, I don't know. If somebody has diabetic ketoacidosis, how many times are we going to resuscitate them with that? And if the answer isn't the same number of times, we got a problem with stigma, and we've got a problem with equality of treatment for people who have addiction, which we do have. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, didn't mean to hit that. Um, so syringe service programs. You know, well, why should we do that? Aren't we just encouraging people to continue to use IV drugs? No, we're encouraging people to not spread infectious diseases. And the other thing we're doing is we're engaging people. If somebody's coming to us at a syringe service program, they're in, in, on some level saying, there's something not right about my using here and I need to do something about it. And if their first step is that I will do a syringe service program with that, that's fine. People who enter syringe ser service programs are six times more likely to eventually enter rehab treatment. That makes a big difference. It's again about meeting people where they are. And then fentanyl test strips. So fentanyl uh, has been, is associated with about 73% of all lethal overdoses in Ohio. Fentanyl test strips are strips that basically someone can test their drug to see if fentanyl is present. They aren't perfect, but most of the studies indicate that people will change their using behavior if they use fentanyl test strips and it turns out to be positive. So it's not yet an evidence-based treatment. I would say it's a promising treatment. Obtaining funding for it can be somewhat difficult. The federal government will not fund fentanyl test strips right now because it is not an evidence-based treatment but I think it's on the way to be something that's uh, being used more commonly. Naloxone, again, opioid antagonist blocks the effects of the opioid medication and reverses the effects of overdose, basically uh, keeps people alive. Doesn't have any abuse uh, potential, and it saved tens of thousands of lives right here in Ohio. Okay, so where are we? We've done all of these things, where are we? So this is the course of opioid-related deaths in the past 10 years. And it went up and up and up and up until 2017. And in the second quarter of 2017, we started to see the rates in Ohio go down. And so that continued uh, throughout 2018. And there were about 1,000 less deaths due to opioids, in, uh, due, uh, due to any uh, illicit drug, any drug for that matter, in 2018 compared to 2017. That's about a 22.3% reduction. That's more than any other state in the country. So we, we have made some good headway with this. It's not time for us to celebrate by any stretch of the imagination. You know, we're still losing 3,000 people plus due to overdose, which is like 3,000 people too many. But we are encouraged about it, and it's telling us that we are doing a lot of the right things that are associated with it. So a bit of good news with that. So where are we with different drugs? We can follow this over the long term here, but clearly prescription drugs were the main issue for the longest period of time, uh, and that would be the, the yellow line that uh, uh, that has decreased also in the past several years here. As the use of prescription drugs decreased, we started to see an increase in heroin, 
the use of heroin peaked in about 2016 and has decreased since then. We start, first started to see fentanyl in 2014, and it peaked in 2017 and has dropped somewhat uh, since then also with the, uh, with the decreased number of overdoses uh, in general. But we also have seen an uptick in cocaine and in methamphetamine, and that's been particularly problematic in this part of the state. Uh, methamphetamine is nothing new in this part of the state or in the state in general. But the methamphetamine that we're seeing right now is different than the methamphetamine we were seeing in the early 2000s. The methamphetamine in the early 2000s, I think a lot of people here remember, was basically homegrown stuff, uh, that people were cooking it up with Sudafed and other kinds of things. This is pharmaceutical grade methamphetamine that is, uh, that is uh, coming to us the same way that um, fentanyl and other illicit drugs have been coming, which is through the southern border here. Additionally, we're seeing that uh, much of that, not all of it, but much of it is tainted with fentanyl. So although we don't commonly see, um, we don't commonly see casual users of heroin, we do sometimes see casual users of cocaine, people who use it on an episodic basis. So the drug that they've used episodically and not had major issues with before could suddenly become a lethal drug uh, because it's tainted with fentanyl. Additionally, as people age, uh, they're more susceptible to some of the medical adverse effects of it. So we are seeing, uh, particularly in the African-American population, we're seeing men in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who are dying from overdoses, which is not something we see nearly as much with opioids alone. So again, people who may have been experienced users previously first may be getting drugs that are tainted with opioids, making them more lethal, but also are more susceptible to having uh, cardiac arrhythmi arrhythmias because of aging myocardium and other kinds of things that make them more susceptible to having arrhythmias due to these drugs. So that's, uh, that's kind of the downside and why we need to stay focused on this and keep watching the data to see how, this, how, the, how things change. When we look at race and ethnicity, uh, in 2017, for the first time in 10 years, the overdose rate among African-American men in, uh, was higher than the rate of Caucasian men, and that has continued since then, much of which is due to the use of cocaine and other stimulants. And this is what I had mentioned earlier about the age distribution. And, you know, we can see what is unique among the black non-Hispanic males is the highest rate being in men 55 to 64 and 65 plus, uh, which is something that's new and again we feel is attributable to stimulants and cocaine. And this is what I kind of highlighted earlier about much of the methamphetamine and the uh, cocaine is tainted with uh, fentanyl or other opioids. So what else are we doing with this? Recovery Ohio. Uh, is an initiative of Governor DeWine. Uh, there is a specific office within the governor's office that, uh, that uh, looks at recovery and um, all state departments and many uh, community organizations are part of this. There was an executive order. This was one of the first executive disorders of Governor DeWine. And this was a group that put together recommendations. There were 75 recommendations that were put forth with this. You may recognize some uh, people in this picture uh, who participated. Um, and so what were the recommendations to look at these eight broad areas? Stigma and education being number one, when I think that really deserves to be number one. Parity, workforce development, prevention, harm reduction, treatment and recovery support, specialty populations, and always looking at it through a data lens. So we get to the end here. What should worry us? <coughs> These are the things that keep me up at night. The mortality rate is still unacceptably high. We're encouraged that there has been a decrease in mortality rate, but it's still way too high. There's not enough uptake of evidence-based treatments and prevention. Much of our field of addiction medicine is rooted in folklore, regrettably. But we have a good database and we have a lot of good prevention, evidence-based prevention, evidence-based treatment. We need to keep doing the things that are demonstrated to be effective. The bias against people suffering with substance use disorders, and they certainly are suffering. This perception that people who have addiction are just getting high all the time is a bunch of baloney. As the disease progresses, people are just using 
to feel a little bit less miserable than they do when they're not using. It, it, it's, it's so sad when we see that. As well as the bias against people who treat individuals who are experiencing addiction. We have to worry about the long-term effects. We have to worry about children and their effect on, on and the effect of uh, opioids on development and their future life trajectory. When we look at some of the kids of the opioid epidemic who were exposed in utero to opioids, and then we see that obviously they have a mother who was addicted. Frequently they have a father who was addicted and may be absence, a absent as a result of that. They may have been incarcerated. They may have died. You start adding up all the life stresses that they have faced. Those don't add up to a good likelihood of life success unless we intervene appropriately. We need to worry about the long-term physical effects of opioids, the social effects and the uh, effect it's going to have on their longevity. We have to worry about the future of Medicaid uh, because although Medicaid has been expanded in Ohio, it's not a done deal. I think all you have to do is read the newspaper from time to time and you see that the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion is still under assault at times. And if we lose Medicaid expansion, we're going to lose a lot of insurance coverage for people who need it. We need to worry about what the new normal is going to be. I worry about that. Is 3,000 deaths a year going to be what the new normal is, and are we going to accept that? I sure hope not, because we have a lot more to do with it. I also wonder about when did we decide life is supposed to be pain-free? It started sometime in the 1990s. You, know, you were supposed to be pain-free, and that's why we got into this with prescribing more opioids. And you know, folks, life isn't pain-free, is it? It's not free of physical pain, and it's surely not free of emotional pain. And unfortunately, opioids do a great job of relieving both of those temporarily, but causing more problems with both of those in the end. I wonder what happened to alcoholism, and we already talked about that. It didn't go away. It's still the number two killer among drugs of abuse in our country, with number one being tobacco. I worry about the resurgence of cocaine, amphetamine, and fentanyl-tainted drugs. That said, there's still a lot of room for hope. The first being that we've done this before. We've done this with ischemic heart disease and we've done this with AIDS. And we look at how AIDS has turned around from when I was in medical school in the early 1980s to today. In the 1980s, AIDS was a death sentence. You died within a few years of your diagnosis of AIDS. And now it's not anymore. It's much more of a chronic disease where people live decades with, uh, you know, with the HIV virus. And how did it turn around? It turned around with good science and a public commitment. And the opioid crisis is starting to turn around too with good science and a public commitment. And so if we keep doing that, we're gonna keep making headway. Things have improved. We've got a lot more MAT, we've got less opioid prescribing, we've got less use in adolescence, and we've got the OD trend that's heading in the right direction. We have good treatments and good prevention that's already available, we just need to use them more broadly. Our community is very much invested in addressing this. I hope that eventually it destigmatizes substance use disorders, and I think we're making headway in that. Most people know someone who has been affected by the opioid crisis here or have lost a friend, relative, or neighbor due to opioid overdose. We need to learn to monitor major changes in national practices to limit unintended consequences. So that's a long statement. But I can't help but wonder, if someone would have noticed in 2001 or 2002 that the rate of deaths due to opioids was increasing, as was the prescribing of opioids, would we be at a different point today than when it was really generally noticed 2009, 2010, 2011, and that's when the serious effort started? I like to think that we would be. And then I think we have to look at other things that are developing now, the role of technology, artificial intelligence, uh, apps on phones and things like that, all of which are being looked at and, and showing real promise to help people with addiction, both in terms of prevention of addiction as well as treatment. So there are a lot of good things happening here. And it's the community involvement that is really the key for us to make progress in this. And I, I thank everybody for being part of that. What can we do? Talk to kids about drugs. Help them build resiliency. Clean out your medicine cabinet, please delay or eliminate exposure to any drug of abuse, and yes, that does include vaping. Tobacco use has decreased substantially in the past 20 years,
but vaping has increased in the past several years significantly. And it's still nicotine, and it's still addictive, and we still know that there are problems that are associated with it. And we can go back to the very beginning. Why is there so much vaping? Decreased perception of harmfulness, increased availability, increased use, increased addiction. It's the same story. Patients and, and prescribers need to collaborate on effective low-risk pain management working in communities because all of us have something to offer. Looking at addiction as a chronic disease, using our specific knowledge, whatever that is, to help the problem, and fighting stigma, fighting stigma, fighting stigma. So thanks so much for listening to me this afternoon. I'm over time. Sorry, Dr. Johnson. Can, can, we, can we take a question or two before? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great, great question. So the first one is how long should somebody be on MAT? The answer is I don't know. Uh, what I know is that they probably need to be on it for at least a year. And at the end of that year, there needs to be a serious discussion between the provider and the patient about the treatment and about their future. So I wouldn't even consider stopping it before a year. I mean, if somebody insisted, yeah, I want to stop it after a year, well, you know, you do what you do and you taper them gra gradually with that. I think that um, this is a chronic disease and we need to treat it chronically. So why did I come up with that number of a year? Well, what we know about in addiction in general is that it's not until you reach a year of sobriety that you have about a 50-50 chance of long-term success. And it's not until you reach five years of sobriety that you have about a 90% of long-term success. So I think the provider and the patient need to have that serious discussion about those kind of things. And then if the decision is made, I want to, be, I want to try to get off this medication, then it is tapered slowly and carefully. There are frequent appointments during that time. We see if there's any increase in craving or anything like that associated with it, which tells us it's time to slow down on this and reconsider that. Uh, but there are risks of coming off MAT, uh, and the risks of continuing on MAT are not particularly high. Do I think there are some people who probably need to be on MAT long term or maybe their whole lives? Yeah, I do think there are people like that. Just like there, I think there are people who need to be on antidepressants their whole life because when they come off them, some really bad things happen with them. But I think that's highly individualized. We will develop better science to know which of these three MATs is better for which person and how long they should be on it, but we're not at that point yet. The other question was, what about safe injection sites? I don't think that Ohio is probably at a point where that's something that would be accepted. Uh, there are... Um, uh, certain communities elsewhere in the world that are doing that and seeing some success. So I think we need to watch what is going on in those areas. And if there are continued positive things, then that's something we need to look at in terms of our own culture, our own laws, and our own rules about whether that's something that would, uh, would be something we need to look at in our, in our culture. Any other questions? Yeah, so the question was, why does Southern Ohio seem to be so particularly affected by this? And I would add, why is it not only affected by drugs, but why are suicide rates higher in this area and things like that? When you look at what we know about things that help, for instance, with suicide rate, an improving economy is supposed to decrease suicide rates. And that's been true in some areas and not true in other areas. I think it has something to do with people being left behind. I think it has something to do with cultural trauma and things of that nature. And it gets back to those diseases of despair. That if we don't see a future, what does that tell us that we need to do in the present? And so having economic opportunity and other kinds of things like that, I think is probably something that is as important as everything else. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Absolutely, yeah. I probably, you know, I'll just make up an answer if I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So I'm going to pair. The question was about medical marijuana. So the first thing I would say is that the literature about medical marijuana is sparse, the medical literature. And much of the literature out there is tainted. Uh, and, and it is tainted by the particular ideological bent of the person who is doing the research. There's not great research, period. But uh, and that would go on both sides, for pro-marijuana and, uh, and anti-marijuana groups. So it's hard to discern all of that. Uh, I think one of the problems that I see, at least, is that um, it would have been ideal if 50 years ago we would have started doing serious research on the effects of individual cannabinoids. So marijuana has hundreds of substances in it, you know, which, which are cannabinoids. And so rather than looking at medical marijuana, it would really be, what are the biological effects of THC? What is it effective in? What is it not effective in? What are the doses? What are the side effects and things like that? Some of that's been done, and we have an FDA-approved form of THC. Similar thing for cannabidiol. So there has been some research that's been done with that. Now it's FDA-approved for the treatment of certain refractory seizure conditions and things like that. But because we've not done that research for the past 50 years, now we're kind of in the Wild West where uh, you know, we have marijuana products which have all these different cannabinoids in it. It's hard to know what the dose should be of those. It's hard to monitor the side effects of them. The uh, conditions that they are approved for, the literature for all but a couple of them is really pretty darn weak. So we're kind of making some things up as we go along. So I think that that's potent that that is problematic about where we are right now. So you know somebody says, you know well I hear it's effective for X Y or Z. I don't have good literature with that, and I don't think that's a good way for me to practice medicine. You know I, I think a good way for me to practice medicine is to identify a diagnosis, to identify a treatment, and to know what those treat what the treatment dose what the dosage should be and what the side effects are and work with the patient uh, on those particular things. You know, one of the things that is under consideration now is um, using marijuana for anxiety. Well, all of us have anxiety. You know, I mean, I think if we look at it in terms of treatment for panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder or things like that, that's a whole other story. That's a diagnosable condition. And, and we need to have some literature to back up its effectiveness or lack thereof. But anxiety in general is a mood state it's not really a diagnosis. So if we're really looking at this from a medical perspective, we need to say diagnosis, treatment, dosage, side effects, duration of treatment, and things like that, looking at it from a scientific perspective. And we're just not right, we're not there right now. And, and you know, I get it, if we would have done the research, we might have been there right now, but we haven't done that. So it's a real conundrum, and it's something we're gonna have to struggle with for a long time. Uh, and I don't, I'm eating into all of Dr. Johnson's time here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. But, the association between cannabis use and psychosis is very clear, and the more marijuana that is smoked during adolescence, the le more likely it is that that individual will develop a psychotic disorder. There are genetic influences on that. I don't want to get into all that today. Again, that's a whole other ball of wax, but um, we need to watch the marijuana situation very closely. I am going to step out now, and thank you very much for talking with me. Thanks, Mark. So I'm, I'm going to go on off of the, the three Bs, which is be brief, brother, on 
It's been, a, it's been a great day. I admire all of you for your stamina and being with us throughout the whole day. I do want to have a few closing words as we think about the work on, that we're doing. Um, there's a physician that I deeply admire. His name is Bernard Laun. <clears throat> and you may not know him personally, but he had a lot of contributions to medical care, including inventing the first implantable defibrillator. But the thing he's probably more known for was founding on Physicians for Social Responsibility. And Physicians for Social Responsibility became a worldwide movement looking at social issues. And he credits the Berlin Wall coming down as a result of physicians from East and West Berlin working together around a social issue on, in, in Germany. One of the things that I loved about working with him, he's a cardiologist in Boston, uh, is he had a, a, a comment that I, I just live by, and I absolutely love it. He said, when you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. And this issue that we're working on is really hard. And um, every problem has a solution. It's just that they're not always easy. They're not always readily available. You can't always see them. But us working together, I do think that we can see the invisible and do the impossible on, as, as part of that. So I want to thank all of you for being here today and just kind of frame the ending of this as our vision for this is working together. On, that means sometimes that you're leading and we're following. Sometimes we're leading and you're following. Um, we don't believe that we're the answer. We believe that we're here together to, um, to discover that answer and that solution. So with that in mind, we've been a little bit passive. There's a couple things I'm, I want to ask from you all, which is, um, was there any key point or key moment in the day that you want to kind of share with us? I know we have the forms that we have out in the back, but was there any key learning, key point to take home that anybody would like to say, hey, this was really kind of an aha or something that you want to punctuate from the day and our time together. He, here and then over here. Yes, please. Yep, it takes a community. Great. Yes, making it clear that addiction is a, is a disease. And, and we see that too here, that the opioid issue is a much bigger issue than, than opioids, right? It's addictions, it's, it's the social determinants of health, it's everything that's kind of wrapped around it, and that's the symptom, the end, the end part of it. So, any other thoughts? Yeah, the number of resources available, and, and, and I have had that experience in bringing communities together like this before where someone will say, and everybody knows about, and like, I was like, I'm sorry, I didn't know about that. That's great. Thank you for letting me know. Anything else? Sure, so, the, so youth, prevention, early intervention, uh, et cetera, great. Yeah, excellent, thanks. Anybody else wants to share? Yes. Definitely, yep, so the ripple effect. Let me ask the question in one slightly different way. We, we hope to be able to continue in dialogue on, uh, in the coming years. You know, this isn't something that we just, is, is, is one and done. Is, is there anything that we did from today that you would suggest that we 
repeat or carry forward or do again in the future? Is anything particularly valuable? So the collaboration with different with different agencies and groups. Yeah. All right. Right. Great. Thank you. Great. Excellent. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. So, so could you re repeat the beginning part of that again? Yeah, so it's validation from all the work and that it's a big problem and that moving the needle a little bit is better than not moving the, the needle at all and that there is really a lot of work that's going on out there. A anything else that you would say, hey, we should definitely... Oh, that's a great... So bringing in peer recovery support, that, that would be great. Good idea. Right, so bringing in in art for as part of recovery in the in a variety of ways. Yep. Hearing from different physicians in different fields. Yep. So breaking breaking down silos, and do you do you think it would be worthwhile for us to try to spend some time around how you could specifically do that? And the reason I ask is, in one of the breakout sessions, there was a lot of conversation about here's how we would suggest you work with. On so, do you think it would be valuable for us to do something that's specifically kind of tactical in that way about breaking down silos and connecting in communities? Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Excellent. Anything else? So a couple of last closing on comments. Um, Dean Lighty and I would like to thank you for, for being here and for participating. I would ask, my ask of you is just what you said here, which is for us to try to connect to each other, for you to reach out to us, for you to reach out to each other as we continue to work on these on issues together. And I think Tracy might have left the room, but I do want to thank Tracy Plauk for her work. It's really all on her shoulders for bringing this together, and she made uh, Randy and my job really very, very easy. So when you see Tracy, please thank her for her work, and have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you.